Right, hello everyone. Um, as you can see, it is not Monday. Uh, this is a special stream um, because a few days ago I was invited on to a podcast that my friend Julianne hosts. Um, she works for the Phoenix Conservatory of Music here in Phoenix, um, and she's very active in the jazz scene here. Um, and so she is hosting this podcast that's about uh, social issues as they relate to music. And we recorded an episode a few days ago that actually got taken down by PCM um, because they feared that it was a little bit too uh, on the nose politically uh, and a little bit too direct with some of the things that we were chatting about. So... Um, I uh, talked to her about it, and we decided that we wanted to re-stream it on my channel, uh, and PCM gave us permission to do this. So here is uh, just a podcast episode that was recorded. It's just a conversation between myself and Miss Julianne Colwell about social issues as they pertain to music today. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the second episode of the ARIA podcast, which is brought to you by PCM, Phoenix Conservatory of Music, and particularly their college prep program, which is our kind of late middle school all through high school program. And um, yeah, just if you're a PCM student, hi, I'm glad to see you again. And if you're someone new, I'm really happy that you joined us. Um, the ARIA podcast is basically just talking about like anything and everything, but also, you know, social issues that come into play with music and the arts in general. So every week we're going to try to talk about something a little bit different, but um, just with my background as a music performer and um, as a teacher, you know, themes of those uh, topics might come up. So <laughs> let's get me to not talk anymore for a second. And I want to introduce, <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, oh my God, everyone here who's watching me probably knows me at least a little bit. So <laughs> I want to introduce my guest this week, which is one of my really good friends, Ben Vining. So hi. Um, yeah, I'm just going to let you take it away and tell me a little bit about yourself first. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Like she said, my hi. name is Ben Vining. Um, <laughs> I am an electronic musician. Um, I, uh, I kind of met, well, I didn't, we didn't really like know each other, but like the first time I like mm -hmm. knew of you and like saw you was when we were both at ASU, Arizona State. Um, I went there for composition, music composition for two years. And then I eventually switched to theater, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But <laughs> I remember just like seeing you in our theory classes and like, Ooh, like she seems chill, but like we didn't really ever talk. And then it was like, only like years later <laughs> that through mm -hmm. my fiance Christian, who is also a composer, we kind of reconnected. So uh, anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm an electronic musician and um, I have a little bit of a background working in professional theater um, before the entire industry was <laughs> abolished. <laughs> I, yeah, seriously. I was working at a little theater in downtown Phoenix called the Black Theater Troupe um, as a stage manager. And like I said, I did the second half of my time at ASU in uh, stage management for theater. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot to mention like how we met because I, I don't think we actually did meet in person at ASU. I just also knew who yeah, you were. Yeah, I don't were, think we ever you know? really, like, yeah. Yeah, like, we had classes together, because I'm pretty sure we at least had music theory together for, like, a semester. Like, that theory least, two class, maybe? Or was it theory one? Was no. that the one with the Russian lady? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, neither of us remember her name, but we, like, I I've know. been trying to think of what her name was, because, I don't know, but I can't remember what her name was. Well, she was only around for like, I don't even for know like if she was around semester. for, yeah, I don't like even know if she was around for a whole year. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. she was, yeah. I did not enjoy her class. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the theory curriculum at ASU is still, I don't know, maybe it's better now, but when I was there, it was still finding its footing, I think. Uh, yeah. The professors were kind of coming and going, and the way that the curriculum was laid out was kind of in transit a little bit, and it it felt a little bit... Uh... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people were definitely coming and going because my, my theory, one professor 
was gone by the time this new professor came in and then she was gone after a semester and then I just decided to give up on taking music theory at ASU and I took it at Mesa Community College because I was like (laughs) we're done right and I think it's partly because of that but like my last guest from last week Kate she was a TA and of course your fiance Mm -hmm. was a TA and like they both know how insane sometimes it felt to (laughs) be a TA there but I definitely think that'll come up again in future episodes because I was planning on having some other former TAs on, not just because they're former TAs though, but like, (laughs) I just happen to know a lot of former theory TAs from ASU. I guess we all just... New from PCM, the Critiquing ASU Music (laughs) Curriculum show. Oh no, (laughs) I know. (laughs) But that definitely ends up kind of sneaking its way in well I think it's just because we all have like shared experiences at the same place right and so we We all kind of we all and sometimes we have shared like feelings and opinions and sometimes we have differing opinions I'm definitely going to talk to some people that like have a totally different outlook than I did but I don't know sure and well I mean even just like you being in the jazz program you were in a much different environment than I was absolutely yeah and I mean when you were, when you first got there, was it 2015? 15, yeah, wait. Yeah, okay, yeah. So that was yeah. my sophomore year. And I don't Trump even know. was elected when I was a sophomore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> I know, like, so where were you in 2016? I remember thing? the night that it happened, actually. <gasps> Me too. I remember it very well because I was stuck. It was back when I was working at Target during my undergrad, and I was stuck. Oh, like, God, were you at work? Mm -hmm. I was at work all night and I have lots of I have lots of voter guilt because what happened is like I voted in the primary but I had work that night on election night and this was back before I knew about mail-in ballots because you know how they just make sure that the young people are as uninformed as possible (laughs) like at least in 2016 yeah it was rough so I just thought well if I can't do it on election day and I just I just had to work I didn't have time so I was there all night and I was at the fitting room and I had my phone (laughs) which I shouldn't have had it but I think we were all like really like stalking our phones on a day like that Mm -hmm. and then it just got more and more depressing as the night went on because I was closing so I was there till midnight so we were really there till like the very end of kind of finding everything out and I, I mean, none of my coworkers, none of the people at Target were Trump supporters. So we were all just like, like shocked <laughs> and sad. And then I went to uh, my boyfriend at the time's house and everyone was just like, they'd lost it. Everyone was like crying or yelling or <laughs> like, seriously, we were all just having a time. So well, I remember definitely. the thing I remember most about watching the election night coverage in 2016 was all the like commentators and announcers I think had this like attitude of like this isn't this can't really be like we're like what's happening like we're trying to report on it but like this can't really be you know and like honestly like ever since well not ever since then but especially during the pandemic that's kind of how I feel Ah. you know it's like the Mm -hmm. there's a, a global pandemic there's a virus that's killing everyone and we have no unemployment no health insurance no stimulus Mm. money and it's like this can't really be (laughs) what our reality is can it they can't this can't really be like what what's actually happening (laughs) seriously I feel that so much and I mean I didn't even get my first stimulus check I qualified for it yeah and you know and you didn't you also try to get on unemployment at one point and you weren't able to I tried to get on unemployment two times and I was not able to. And um, yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. It's just been such a crazy time. And in 2016, I really couldn't have possibly predicted like how things would have turned out. I mean, obviously I couldn't have predicted the pandemic, but that's not what I mean. It's just kind of like, we all like knew that he was saying he was going to do all sorts of stuff. But I didn't think he would actually go through with any of it because I just didn't think it would happen. I was unaware, though, that, you know, it, it was a pretty red in general, just like everything, everyone was red, which means that whatever Trump wanted to do, he had a lot of support. 
to get those things done. I didn't realize since we had Obama and I was still like, I don't know, how old was I in 2016, 22? <laughs> I don't know. I was pretty young. I was pretty unaware. So I didn't really know what was going on. And then as time went on, and this is what's great about this presidency is that that's the only thing that's great about this presidency to me is that I learned how to really take this kind of stuff seriously and to be more informed mm -hmm. and to just care more about this stuff. Cause you yes. know, I think when you well, have a president I, that you like, you don't really need to worry about any of that stuff. I don't know. That's kind of how I felt. Sure. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, it, it's hard to find a silver lining in this presidency, mm -hmm. but I think that if anything, you know, if Trump loses, mm -hmm. then in retrospect, his presidency will become a nice analytical tool for us. And the reason why is because he, everybody kind of agrees that he's horrible and it's hard to deny that, you know, even people like Ben Shapiro, when he yeah. made his video saying, I'm voting for Trump this year, even he said like, oh yeah, like I don't like all the things he says. And sometimes he's, you know, so everyone yeah. across the board agrees that Trump is horrible. And then in retrospect, if Trump loses, we can look back and we can say, actually, you know what? This was not the greatest anomaly ever. Because if you just look at Trump's policy and what he's done, he really is a very successful Republican. He's a lot of other things. Yes, he is, you know, a little bit fascistic and he is taking yeah. things to another level in terms of rhetoric, but what he does with his policy, he's deregulated. He has tried to pack courts with originalist judges. He has, you know, immigration policy. And uh, in terms of like the market economy, he is a very, you know, cut and dry. He's a Republican and he's a successful one at that. And so yeah. when people try to say things like oh well you know i support conservatism but like the real thing or you know it's like just be honest about what your objections to trump are because yeah. you know the reason why he does the things that he does is because he believes in it and not because he's just like some bad person who also happens to be a republican it's that that's what he believes and there's a reason why he says the things that he does and so mm -hmm. i think that if there is a positive to be found in all of this, it's that he's kind of taking the mask off of the Republican Party. And yeah. it's hard for them to hide anymore and say like, oh, well, we're principled and, and just happen to be right wing. It's like, no, all of you are supporting that. Yeah. Well, and, and um, I don't know. I try to stay out of it. Like when it comes to like online interactions with Trump supporters, I like to just read I do comments. Too. I don't like to type and like interact, but you know, something that has been happening, and I told you this when we hung out recently, is when I have been talking to my dad, who has been a Republican and has voted Republican for like up until now, you know, um, he's been trying to talk to his colleagues and like friends and just people that he's worked with in his life about the oh, presidency yeah. and just about like, are you really going to vote for this guy? And one of the one of his colleagues was like, well, I believe in the Republican model, you know, like he's just a true Republican. Yeah. So I'm going to like, he and is that, horrible, but and that's, <laughs> that's really, yeah. really the truth is that he really is. I mean, as much as he's kind of thrown the political script out the window, he really has tried like the things that he actually has tried to do are just the traditional things that Republicans fight for. And so mm -hmm. it it's really is true that, you know, this is the logical conclusion of where the Republican Party has been headed for a really long time, you know, and it's kind of baked into the cake of right wing rhetoric at this point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just kind of, it's just so hard for me to like, navigate how I feel about it. Um, like with um, the Supreme Court justice ruling that happened today yeah, it, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I had never heard of this person before, um, this, you know what I mean? But I yeah. tried to, I tried to look into it, all of it the best that I could. And I mean, it's just, um, yeah, the realities are setting in like for people like me who, who like kind of chose to be uninformed for like a while and then realized, you know, how much I needed to not only like understand what was going on, but 
like use use my voice to like do something about it you know and, like, absolutely you know and, talk to more you know about i it. am Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's always what it comes back to for me is uh, I am a musician by trade and I do want to make a career out of my music. But anybody who follows any of my social media will know that I, I'm not quiet on issues that are important to me and to other you know, people. And because every time I'm scrolling on you know, Twitter or Facebook or something and I see something that's making a really good point about what's happening. I th I, the thought that happens in the back of my head is that I'm, a, I'm white and I'm a masculine adjacent person. I'm non-binary, but lots of people assume that I'm a man. So a lot of people see mm -hmm. me as a white man. And I always think to myself, you know, I, every time I have a choice to either use my platform to amplify that or to move on and to not say anything. And I honestly would rather be a music artist who nobody listens to because they can't stand, but who uses their platform to, their, to the best of their ability to try and amplify causes rather than somebody who is really popular and has a lot of fans by being uncontroversial and never raising their voice about anything. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is huge with a lot of artists and celebrities and all of that, you know, they, um, they have, such a capability to reach so many people. And I mean, mm -hmm. it's not that you have to, if you have a big following, I don't know. I was about to say, it's not that you have to do anything about it, but I kind of think that you do because I think it's kind of like Especially just the way that I feel. if you're white, if you mm -hmm. are a man, if you're cis, if you're straight. I mean, all of these things are not just labels, but I think that they come with things. You know, if you're not cis and if you're not straight, it comes with the trials and tribulations and daily microaggressions and, you know, disenfranchisement that you'll experience as a result of that. But for me as a white person, what, what that comes with for me is I have centuries, more than centuries worth of the oppression that my ancestors have inflicted upon the rest of the world on my back. And so what whiteness comes with for me is the inherent responsibility on my part to work to counteract that and to undo everything that has created yeah. the world that makes whiteness such a privilege for you and I, you know, well, you know like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, <laughs> I was just going to say, this is something, this is something to look into for anyone who's watching this, who hasn't, who hasn't heard of the term whiteness before. I would just encourage you to look into that and look it up. Um, Cause yeah, if you don't already know what it's about, I, I don't want to like try to exactly name what it is because I think whiteness is a really like vast, um, it's it's more than just like a sentence long definition, you know, there's like it a lot of things is. that goes into it. But well, and yeah. it's one of those terms that's difficult to talk about and define because historically whiteness has usually been defined not by who it includes, but by who it excludes. Uh, and so it's hard to say whiteness is these people and these people and these people, because usually it has just been more about we need to legally identify who is not white so we can decide who to not give rights and privileges to. And that was the reason why whiteness was created. Yeah, I mean, and just like, I, as a, I mean, as a woman, I think I deal with, a, a fair amount of, you know, stuff. <laughs> Certainly. Um, but as a white woman, I don't deal with any of the, like, really any of the things that that white or not, ugh, that non-white people deal mm -hmm. with, women of Certainly. color deal with. Like something that just came to mind really quick. Um, I don't want to like get way too into this tangent, but um, I have been pulled over by the police like seven times. I've never gotten a ticket once. I've never gotten a ticket. Really? They always let me go. Yeah, I've never gotten a ticket. And I've been, I've been, I don't know, I'm, <laughs> whatever. I'm, I haven't done anything terrible, but I've broken the law enough for them to pull me over and, and need to talk to me. Like I've had expired registration and I've sped, like I've been speeding and stuff. There are things that like deserve a ticket that I didn't get a ticket for. And I think it's because I'm a young white woman 
And um, I don't think that that would have happened to someone my age who is a woman of color. And, and I you're actually also know that. Attractive. Mm -hmm. Well, not, you know, you're not yeah. a fat person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't just to have... be frank, I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I have dealt with, I mean, <clears throat> I haven't had a cop like blatantly hit on me before. I've mostly had cops that like mansplain things to me that I like 110,000% understand for no reason other than to intimidate me and to make me feel bad as to like why they were pulling me over. Right. Like seriously, just explaining the like dumbest thing to me ever. Um, and I don't want to go into it too much, but that's kind of how I felt. I felt like belittled and treated like I was less than, which yes. is usually like how, how women feel around, you know, police officers. And I'm not saying this all the time. I, I want to put out just like a thought that I'm not trying to like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get too into um, how I feel about like the cops in this episode right now. Um, I, I don't want to get too unloaded with it because I have pretty negative feelings about them. Like I can just say that. Um, <laughs> and that's where I'll keep it right now. Um, because, you know, part of why I started this podcast is because I wanted to talk about the issues that are going on in the world right now. And I wanted to be able to like openly and candidly talk about like the frustrations that I have as well, you know, and of course I run the risk of offending somebody. Of course, I run the risk of a, of a parent of a PCM student going, oh, my God, why are well, they talking I mean, about this? You even know? if we just kept the conversation strictly to music, mm -hmm. I mean, even a lot of art is inherently political. Uh, you know, I th one a really good example of this that comes to mind is on Twitter the other day, I saw some people talking about Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever his first name was. <laughs> they were and and like somebody had made some kind of point about how like Mr. Rogers would be voting for Biden or like some kind of like not even like a great point but just like a mm -hmm. point you know and like and somebody in response to that was all like stop trying to politicize Mr. Rogers like all he meant was all he stood for was being friendly to everyone that's not a political stance and in this day and age of gay people, trans people, non-white people, you know, mm -hmm. like, I, I kind of had to really pause at that and go, you really think that that's not a political stance? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it really is. I mean, and Mr. Rogers recognized that as well, because there was an episode of his show back when uh, segregation was still a thing. Oh. There was an episode of his show where he had a little pool, a little kiddie pool, and he had a black man come on his show and they put their feet in the same pool on mm -hmm. television. And that was a radical political act at the time. It was. No, it's just ba uh, baked into this little like veneer of like, it's a children's show and we all care about each other. That is radically political <laughs> because the reality is there are a lot of politicians who don't care about, about you or who are actively tr trying to hurt you because they hate you. And that is the mm -hmm. truth. And lots of people, lots of adults vote for politicians like that. Because yeah. they love the things they say. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the, I think not a lot of, but I think that there are some people that support Trump that are like really ignorant without being willfully ignorant about it. I don't think that they oh, realize that's how so much, true. like just how much harm he Should does. Should I tell a little story here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so my grandmother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard about this. Um, no, go for it. Mm -hmm. she's a very sweet lady she i'm trying to think how i should introduce this um anyway the, the point of the story is that my grandmother voted for trump again this year she mm -hmm. did vote for him in 2016 and she voted for him again this year and i got when i learned that i got really mad and so i called her and i kind of expressed my anger um and after that phone call happened, my parents talked to me and they were kind of like, she's confused. And I was like, what? And they go, she doesn't understand why you're upset. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went, what? What do you mean? And it's like, like so obvious. Yeah. And they, and so, and so I called her back and had a conversation and she apparently didn't know 
these things. She, like I told her, I was like, so you under, do you, you understand that like a regular Republican, the regular Republican party mm-hmm. has been trying to outlaw gay marriage since before I was born. And she goes, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and I'm kind of going, you know, like, you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing that just makes me even more frustrated about all of it is that this woman is a white woman with money Mm -hmm. who has always had the ability to fill out a mail in ballot. Mm -hmm. And she abuses that privilege by not informing herself and not literally not watching five seconds of TV in the last 20 years. Otherwise she would know those most basic things, which according to her, she didn't. And so I really see that as somebody who just doesn't recognize the weight and the value of their vote. And I compare and contrast Mm -hmm. that with, you know, people waiting in lines for up to 12 hours on their one day off or, you know, bringing their kids with them because they can't afford a sitter or, you know, things like that. And people like, struggling so hard to be heard and to use their voice and then this you know woman who happens to be my grandmother but that doesn't change the fact that you know she's really just kind of abusing this power that has been granted to her by the fact that she is a wealthy white woman in the state of florida oh gosh the state of florida yeah state of florida <laughs> we love florida's political views no we don't <laughs> i don't well the <laughs> ironic thing about that the, so the the funny part of this entire story is that after I had the second phone conversation with her and I did explain and I was like, I explained to her that Republicans don't like people like me. And she goes, oh, my mm-hmm. God, I didn't know that or whatever. And so mm-hmm. at the end of that phone call, she says, well, you know, I I already sent in my vote, but I kind of hope he doesn't make it now. And and then she goes, oh, I'm going to talk to some people around here about it, too. There you go. And so Mm -hmm. if that's true, and if that actually does end up happening, then it's possible that if Biden wins Florida, the reason will be because I got mad and yelled at my grandmother. (laughs) Well, seriously, this is, this is a big thing. Um, You know, my, my dad, I think definitely watches my podcast. So I don't want to like totally call him out, but I don't believe either of us voted in the last election. And I don't know the full reasonings why, but this election, you know, kind of towards the beginning of the pandemic, both of my parents were like, look, we don't really watch the news right now. And it was because they wanted to, like, not watch the world, like, fall apart and around that them. I get. You know, and, it, and I do get that. And I think that, that that sort of, like, ignorance is, you know, kind of understandable. You know, you need to step away for your own mental well, health. And I, I will you know? also say that a lot of the stuff around Trump you know, these days, I, I really kind of tune out Mm -hmm. because it's like, I do believe in being informed and like, I'll read secondary sources, like, you know, analysis or summaries of what happened, but I Mm -hmm. did not watch the debates. I did not, I don't make Mm -hmm. that habit of watching Trump speak just because it's like, why, why subject yourself to that? You know? It's so ridiculous. It's almost, I mean, I'm still picturing him as the host of the Celebrity Apprentice show because he's still that same person. He's still the same. And he's, he acts like he's on reality television. Yeah. And I think that's part of why a lot of people like him. Like a lot of people like Trump because he's not a politician because, you know, like he says it how it is and he's really going to make things happen because he doesn't play the same game that politicians do. What they don't realize is that he plays the game better than any politician right now, which is why he's managed which to, you know, is sway so arguable. much of the country. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's like, yes, he has been a successful Republican mm-hmm. president in the fact that, like, he has achieved passing deregulative policies. He's put in a lot of judges that are going to be awful. He's done this and done that. But also, every time he speaks, he gives away the game because like mm-hmm. a normal Republican knows that what they have to say is that we're tough on immigration right. for national security. And Trump will go on TV and ju- just say, we need to close down our borders because Mexicans are rapists and they're all criminals. Yeah. And he'll just give away the game like that. And that mm-hmm. actually has had a negative impact. I mean, look at the progressive wave that we had in 2018. And yeah. I think now in 2020, he's seeing you know, what he's reaped, you know, he, his support has, is 
is still strong among white men, and that's about mm-hmm. it. I mean, he's not going to win white women by 53% this year, and mm-hmm. he's not going to win any non-white category uh, if you count both genders, most likely. Right, right. Yeah, although, you know, I definitely, I think that a lot of people, like, I keep trying to go back to kind of this concept of like white privilege and what it means to, you know, use your voice to like, I don't know, change things and not just change things, but I guess change things isn't the right way I'd want to put it. Basically, you know, in America, white people have kind of like controlled the climate of everything for years and years and years and years and years. And people of color have been just, I don't know, some of them have just been dealing with it. I would say that they've been dealing with it because every time that we, I mean, in this day and age, talk about the riots that happened in like the fifties and the sixties and stuff like that about civil rights, people will say, you know, and this is probably a tangent too, people will say, you know, Martin Luther King, he led, he led peaceful protests. He never supported this. He never condoned any of this. He, he was such a, no, I mean, no, he wasn't like he, I mean, he was like one of the most wanted men in America and like white people hated him. They wanted him dead and he ended up dead. And he also, I think that another, mm -hmm. another little point here is that it like, it kind of, when the protests are happening, you know, because Martin Luther King, we talk about in retrospect, but looking at like something like BLM, it mm-hmm. kind of doesn't matter what they do, be, you know, because if they were entirely peaceful, they would mm-hmm. get blamed and they would get called this and, and that anyway. I kind yeah. of, I think it's similar to how when Bernie Sanders was running in the primaries, everybody said, well, we can't have the Republicans trying to say that our candidate is a socialist. So we need to put in somebody else instead. And now that Biden's the candidate, what do they say? They say he's a socialist. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it doesn't matter, you know, Mm -hmm. because they're going to say about you what they're going to say about you. Yeah. And so as far as protest movements go, it's like, you're right that Dr. King was, uh, I I think a better word rather than nonviolence is civil disobedience because mm-hmm. they would do things like shut down roads and yeah. stage sit-ins at lunch counters. And those are, you know, as people in 2020, we might look back at that and say, okay, like, you know, it's still not rioting, looting, whatever. But the fact is those are still acts that are disruptive to white society. And that was the goal. Um, mm-hmm. And so the 2020 version of that, especially when there's a pandemic going on, um, instead of sit-ins at lunch counters, it is going and saying, okay, fuck your target. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and so that's the kind of the 2020 version. And it kind of, like, it doesn't matter to me. You know, they say nonviolence. Well, to me, that means don't be violent against people. You know, yeah. I, I will say that BLM has destroyed some property. Mm-hmm. So what? They're not beating people. They're not uh hurting people the proud boys and the police have injured and killed far more people than blm has and also if you want to talk about like potential bodily harm the vast majority of blm protesters in videos that you can see across social media are masked and the vast majority of police officers at these protests are not Mm -hmm. across the board that has been the trend yeah i believe that i've seen that there's a there's a documentary that uh, the name of it and everything I'll drop into the chat since this is pre-recorded I don't need to do it now but it talks about the Antifa you know mm-hmm. whatever Antifa is to people versus um, you know the alt right and I think it's really fascinating um, it's just I think it'll really open people's eyes if you aren't sure what either of those mean this documentary will kind of clear it up for you. It also shows real footage from the riots that happened in Charleston in, I don't remember, 2017. Um, and it's extremely oh, eye opening. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With the it also, torches. yeah, well, it also shows when, you know, people like the Proud Boys, I don't know if it was exactly the Proud Boys or if it was, I think it was though. They were, 
They were walking around with torches and they were yelling, you will not erase us. You will not erase us. White people are saying, you will not erase us. And I mean, white people came to America. They slaughtered all the Native Americans that they possibly could. They stole their land. They stole everything. They put them on tiny, tiny reservations. And these reservations to this day still do not have the guaranteed running water and electricity. They still don't have those things. polling stations for votes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Navajo Nation recently lost a lawsuit that would have allowed their votes to be counted after election day. They lost that lawsuit. Um, And that's insane. That regardless of the fact that there's, uh, if I remember correctly, I think there's one drop box on the entire Mm -hmm. Navajo Nation. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that don't quote me on that. That might not be correct. But anyway, the point is they lost their lawsuit to allow that. And then I saw another thing like the next day that was talking about some in Pennsylvania, I think it was. they won the Democratic Party, like won a lawsuit of the same thing, saying that mail-in ballots in the state of Pennsylvania would be allowed to be counted past election day. And I'm like, sure, it was a different state decided by a different judiciary body of the state, but still, I'm like, I wonder why in the majority white, you know, dominated state, they're allowed to count mail-in ballots past election day versus the Navajo Nation, you know, indigenous people. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like there's a different legal standard applied. Another really awesome documentary to check out is The West, which is the Ken Burns, you know, big, Mm -hmm. long documentary. Usually those Ken Burns documentaries are kind of like cheesy to me. Like, I think sometimes they really like hit the nail on it or whatever. Sometimes they don't. But this one was really interesting because it's about Westward expansion, which is when uh, we really just completely wiped out all the rest of the Native people that were in this country. And kind of the story behind that and some of the horrible things that they were subjected to just to stay alive. And um, this is not ancient history, everyone. And it's not something that still isn't happening today. Um, You know, I I feel like I'm bouncing off the walls with this conversation, but I, uh, I work at an elementary school now and I teach uh, kindergarten and there isn't a single white person in my entire class. Everyone is Hispanic and there's one black girl and that's, that's the school. What's funny though, is a lot of the teachers are white and um, I think it's really interesting. Huh? Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, it's okay. I was just going to say what I brought up yesterday that, um, you know, in in the state of Arizona, bilingual teaching is not allowed. That's Um, what I was going to bring up. mm -hmm, Yeah. And I don't know exactly when this was banned but it is 100% not allowed to teach Spanish and English simultaneously in school. Yeah, and it's like these Latinx kids Mm -hmm. are on the land of their ancestors that was stolen from them, and it's like on this land that belongs to them, they're not allowed to learn Mm -hmm. their language. I mean, Spanish is still a colonizer language, but it's still Latinx communities... uh, and, you know, a lot of their heritage and culture is tied to the language as well. And uh, there's a similar thing happened with Indigenous people. I mean, I live on Indian School Road. And mm-hmm. what Indian schools were, were they, they took Indigenous children away from their families and they cut their hair so that they, mm-hmm. that they had their hair styled like white kids and they forced them to learn English. And, and they were forbidden to speak themselves. their language ever again. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it was all about forced assimilation um yeah the the native boarding schools are horrific um there are just i don't i I actually know of one person who has told me that they have grandparents that went to those border schools and they didn't have a terrible experience but (laughs) that's like one person out of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who went to these schools and they were assaulted and beaten and much worse in these schools by the people that were supposed to be there to take care of them. And these are boarding schools. So they're completely ripped away from their families again. Um, against and their they're will. alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Against their will. And I mean, I think that a lot of people that I know, especially older people will argue that learning English is very beneficial because this is the United States and we speak English here. Well, guess what? Like the reason why we speak English here is because it was like 
something white people came in here to this country and they 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 forced that to happen because they didn't want to learn the languages that they were already speaking here um you know if we i mean i always thought that it should be required that we learn in arizona that we should learn spanish and it should also be required that we learn a native language so the navajo nation is located in arizona um, I grew up near the Tohono O'odham Nation in Tucson, and you know, what's really, really, really sad about this too is that a lot of the true language is completely erased because all those people that knew how to speak it died. They're gone. They died out. So now this younger generation, and I mean, don't quote me on this either, but um, I think that a lot of the original native languages don't really exist anymore. And they weren't really documented the way that they could have been. So it's really hard to trace well, what my, those were. It, they're, yeah, I, I certainly, I don't know if they're actually extinct, but they're definitely yeah. hard to learn. I mean, yeah. my fiance Christian is a bit of a language nut and mm-hmm. has been learning, you know, French and Japanese and Mandarin and Korean mm-hmm. and Vietnamese. Um, and the other day they said to me, they wanted to try and learn an indigenous language, but it's, hard to do because you, there's mm-hmm. not, you know, it's not on Duolingo. There's not mm-hmm. an app that will just teach it to you. It's, it's oh, knowledge that's more difficult to obtain. And that's kind of mm-hmm. another measurement of like, you know, that speaks to the erasure of this like entire. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. It speaks to the erasure of all, you know, native Americans from our society. I mean, I've heard really ignorant conservatives go, well, they could leave the reservation anytime they want. They don't have to stay there. They don't have to be stuck there on the reservation. It's like, do you not get that they have no money or resources to leave? <laughs> like, do you not understand that like their entire family, generation upon generations have, have lived there and they can't just up and leave to go find a better place to live out in the world? Um, I mean, sometimes they can. Right. And, I, and I have nothing against uh, native families who choose to do that. Um, well, I, think and I don't know that issue, journey. But, the, mm-hmm. This speaks to, it's kind of a common conservative talking point. It's just that like, if your life circumstances, if your material conditions are not good right now, then it's your fault. There's mm-hmm. something that you could or should be doing that you're not. And it's your fault because you've chosen to just not help yourself. Um, which frankly, I think is crap. I think that you can't blame people for a system that has exploited them and treated them as subhuman. And I mean, even going beyond talking about indigenous folks here, I mean, look at, we're in a pandemic right now, right? I had a full-time job and it got taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And now I need unemployment to survive. And I have, there are some family members of mine that have told me that I'm lazy or that, you know, oh, well, your unemployment was more than you were getting paid at the theater, so you shouldn't have expected that to continue. You should have gotten a job because that's the right thing to do. And frankly, that makes me really mad because it's like, you know, not only is that our money, but also mm-hmm. it's like you really think that I'm just a lazy person for not wanting to go out and expose myself to a deadly virus that's killing hundreds of thousands of people. Like, and also, well, and, like, we don't have health care. We don't have health insurance. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and that's, that's not even, I mean, the pandemic is one thing, but it's also, you know, if you did get a job in, let's say, food service, because it was the only option you had, they'd criticize you for that, too. I mean, they would just tell you that that's a lazy job for you to get to. And if they didn't call it lazy, they would just say, well, you can do better. You can do better. Because privileged right. folks, they and look at jobs that- like that, and they think, like, well, that what are you doing? You could, you could make so much more money. What's wrong with you? You have, you know, you have all these resources. Why don't you just go after them? And that's just not really, yeah, not really what it's all about. Either. I just, yeah, I really see that, like that tendency to just blame the individual, like for any like issues in their life, I think is really just a way of avoiding the fact that some of these things are systemic issues. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that so many people, even when they do have jobs, so many people, you know, it's impossible to budget your way out of poverty. Um, if you're making minimum wage and, you know, it, you can't, there's no budget allocation that will allow you to live a comfortable life 
and save up money. You'd be lucky to just pay your bills. And so then when people say things like, oh, well, you just need to learn how to be like financially responsible, or you just need to learn how to do this or that. Uh, my response to that is no, it's not a problem with me and my knowledge. The problem is that I'm being underpaid and my labor is being exploited. Yeah, 110%. And especially for independent contractors, you know, before I was, um, before I was teaching in a school, um, I had a really crazy job um, where, and I mean, I applied for this job because I was interested in doing it, but a lot of people would never in a million years apply for this job. And that's because I was a mortuary transport driver, which means that I was picking up people who have died and putting them in my van. I remember this job. <laughs> And taking them to a mortuary and people are like, what? Like, I don't know if I've told my PCM students about this. So it's just, <laughs> like, I just, I have to say it because I got paid when I was being trained to do this job. I had to drive, you know, with another driver because they needed to show me the ropes. You know, this job has so many layers. I got paid $10 per body to work this job <laughs> when I was being trained. And then <laughs> when I got... <laughs> When I didn't need training anymore, I got paid $20 per body. And I'm sure some I'm of you sorry, high school that kids is the are like, weirdest yeah. rate structure. I've $10 per. I feel like the only other, like, like mortuary drivers and sex workers have like the same rate structure. And those are the only jobs that. <laughs> right. That, <laughs> that's per body. Like that. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's the thing. A lot of, a lot of you high school kids might be like, oh, $20 per. That sounds dope. What's up? No, no. Okay. Cause. It takes on average two to two and a half hours per person, you know, because I don't want to just call them a body to like get the job done. So I was getting paid way under minimum wage, maybe like nine or ten dollars an hour to really do this job. And um, it showed, man, it was. And I mean, you know. Putting aside the fact that they're dead people, you know, and how how, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, that's disgusting. I would never want to be around a dead body. It was also, you know, it was intense, you know, labor. I had to like move physical. these bodies. Yeah. It was very physical and it was very mentally straining because I had to talk to the families of these people who've just lost a loved one. And I had to go in there oftentimes into their house and ask them questions about God, like just stuff that you shouldn't need to ask. You know, I need you to fill out all this paperwork so that I can like legally take this person away from you. You know what I mean? And I mean, this was a during a pandemic job that I found because I, I had no other option. You know what I mean? And, and it was also because, you know, I secretly am a nerd and get really into um, like mortuary and forensic science. But you well, know. and then once you got that job, I remember mm -hmm. you having to be on call for what, like 12, 24 hours at a time? 48 and hours at a time, 48 baby. Hours. <laughs> So I'd have two days on and two days off. And what that means is that I like got to keep the van at my house and yeah, the van with gurneys in the back for the dead people. Yeah. And whenever they called me, no matter what time of day or night or what I was doing, I just had to drop everything, get in my car and go. And I did have to wear a certain uniform so I couldn't just show up wearing anything I wanted. And I mean, there were nights where I wouldn't get any sleep because I would be just about to drift off and they'd call me and I'd have to hop up and drive way across town and go into a family's home and do this job. And then, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. Basically, I guess the point I was like trying to make with this is that jobs that are severely needed, especially in the middle of a pandemic are severely, severely underpaid. Around the time that I quit this job, was when I realized that my safety was like very, very much at risk. Some of my coworkers like didn't want to wear masks, which was like so stupid, but that's like half the problem. The other problem is that people shouldn't were dropping, you like, you know. Hmm? Shouldn't you have like protective equipment on to handle dead people regardless of whether in, in a pandemic? Uh, you know, <laughs> you just really need gloves. Uh, you don't have to wear a mask. I think if they're severely decomposed, you should probably wear a mask, but a lot of these people were pretty recently passed on. So um, <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but it was, it was bad. See, this is, a, this is another like topic that I'm not sure I can really talk about in length. But um, when I was, when people were dying of, of the coronavirus, this was like May, June-ish. 
Um, there were yeah. specific precautions that we had to take with them in order to keep us safe, but because there were so many of them, hospitals were unable to hold their their dead in their morgues because they were running out of space. And so they had to make these makeshift freezers outside and that's not a freezer what it is is it's like a shed with a bunch of fans on that's supposed to cool it down in arizona. and literally in arizona in the middle of the summer and oh. i didn't quit because i was like oh this is disgusting i quit because i was like oh my god so we have no evidence to prove that these bodies are safe to be around in the first place whether they're double body bagged or not you know if droplets I mean, droplets may be dead by the time, you know, your last breath, if you draw your last breath and you're done, maybe there aren't ways to- but the virus would you know, still live in your, your corpse, right? It would, I think, and they, they just haven't proven that it doesn't. They haven't proven that it doesn't live in your corpse. So that's the whole exactly. idea is that it still could. And uh, you know how you have to clean surfaces. I can't sanitize a dead body. I can't. And just wearing yeah. gloves isn't always enough. There were a lot of days where my gloves would rip while I was doing my job. And I would be like hand hand on skin contact. So uh, yeah, it was a fun job though. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was great for a lot, of, a lot of reasons, right? But um, I'm a school teacher now and I get paid just a little over a dollar like a little over a dollar over minimum wage. So minimum wage is twelve dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah. You went from one end of life to the other. <laughs> now you teach yeah. kindergarten. <laughs> I went from only dealing with people who have who are dead or family members of people who are dead to kindergartners who are like, huh? <laughs> 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 I'm sweet little angels, but like they don't know what's going on at all we have to enforce social Same, honestly, distancing though. we have to put masks on them i know right it is just nuts well you is know what my has it been an hour yeah. oh my god has... talk about music <laughs> <laughs> well here's what i'm thinking here's what i'm thinking we can do is i can is i can right. edit out this small portion where i'm talking to you and we can kind of get to some of those points okay. just like real quick and i just might need to like edit down some of this episode um, okay. Yeah. Just like slightly, I'm and then so sorry for I can. All the no, it's okay. I can. I think it went well. I think I can just archive some of it and like upload it yeah. separately later. And because I just totally. do need to make sure it's appropriate. Because like, kind of the thing I just finished talking about, I probably just need to cut it off sooner. Like I could say that I was a mortuary transport driver, but I shouldn't be talking about. I don't know. I'm just gonna find yeah, out. I think I said fuck once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> I think you only it's did really once, mean. but. Yeah, I can I can cut that out and it won't take away from from what you say or anything like that. But totally. Um, I do know. So, <laughs> so I know that a lot of your music is a little bit political, and you have music that represents kind of how you've been feeling about not only like the Trump presidency and like America as it is right now, but also like stuff that you've been doing since the kind of since the pandemic began. So it'd be really cool if you talked to me a, bit, a little bit about that. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, <laughs> I, I have <laughs> made some music that's very political in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but recently, I have started to kind of take a different approach. I mean, uh, so my my current album that's that's coming out very soon um is very it's instrumental mostly and it's it's very kind of meditative and just kind of reflective and i i think the reason why i decided to do that was because i realized that that can be like joy and and happiness and like the mental space for calm can be also a radically political thing. Um, Absolutely. Especially if it's queer joy, you know, the, um, a lot of my album is just kind of supposed to meant, supposed to be meant to, uh, 
just be calm and meditative. And uh, what it's for is for people to kind of be able to listen to it and de-stress and help them relax. And I, it's, it's for uh, marginalized folks. It's for queer people and people of color and, and women. Um, because, you know, in the past I had been making music that was kind of really angry and expressing mm -hmm. just like, you know, people, these people are horrible. <laughs> these things are bad that, you know, which I kind of stopped to think about it. And I, and I kind of realized that I was making music for our oppressors. I was making music that was supposed to be listened to by a Trump supporter to try and change their mind. And I kind of realized that that's not where I want to be putting my energy. I don't want to make music for our oppressors. I want to make music for us. And I want to make a creative space that's for us and by us. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of like where I'm at currently is um, I think that my music is still political, even if it's not like lyrics talking about Trump is bad. I think that it is still kind of political in that it's it's kind of like a, a respite a little bit for uh, people who are affected by things going on in the world today. I love that. That's amazing. I mean, I've heard I've heard all sorts of things that you've composed and made, and I haven't heard um, more from your upcoming album than what you've put out on your Instagram stories and stuff and the little previews. Yeah. I've just been kind of saving it for when it's like completely out because I know that with your music, it's really fun to listen to from the beginning to the end. Um, like the EP that you released, um, and I don't remember what it's called, but it had it had your face on it with the with all the you know cool yeah, colors. Yeah, that stuff. was called <laughs> intelligently artificial. That was kind oh, of oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that was like kind of a proof of concept for my vocal harmonizer instrument, um, yeah. which is basically you sing and you play a keyboard and it's a piece of software that takes your voice and shifts it to all the different pitches that you have played on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a piece of software that I actually created myself and I just wanted to use it and like, in, you know, in something just to put it out there. And so mm -hmm. that was what I came up with is it was just a little set of kind of improvisations that I did on the harmonizer. And then I, I mixed it into an actual EP yeah, that one was that one was really, really fun for me to listen to. And what I liked Thanks. to do was listen to it. Like, I tried to listen to it all in one sitting before I just kind of like picked and, and chose tracks or whatever. Totally. And it was the same with the stuff. And so Ben has released a lot of music um, just for for all of you that are not familiar. Um, they released a lot of covers as well. And um, mm -hmm. The covers were really awesome because they always used your harmonizer instrument, or at least I think they always did, because you did the almost, Creeks cover. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. almost all of them, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that the first one that you put out was the Creeks cover, and mm -hmm. I love, love, love that one. And then we did our cover together. And yeah, um, that was a really fun one. Yeah, that one was awesome. And I'll probably I'll probably put that down below too or down below. I feel like I'm such a YouTuber all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like Comment down below. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think Bring the chat the is like over here. So like if you're is in the really? chat, I think, well, when I'm watching on Twitch, the chat is like to, to my right. I don't know. Either it's, way. It's always hard to tell it. Cause like, I'm like sometimes <laughs> on Twitch too. Sometimes I think the video like mirrors in weird ways. Oh, for like, sure. I'll be like looking at my like preview of like what I'm streaming and I try to point to something and it ends up going the other way. And so then I try to point the other way and it's, I'm all <laughs> hard to tell. And I'm just so new to the whole Twitch thing, like a hundred percent new to it. So it's like really weird for me, but I'll put it in the chat. We did a cover of the Beatles song girl. And I remember yeah. how we thought about it was, I don't even, I feel like I was just talking to you and Christian about across the universe, which was like the movie that came out when I was in, middle school of like of all Beatles songs but it had like a different storyline and stuff and the oh, Jim Sturgis who um uh, like played the main character Jude I was like so in love with him oh my god like <laughs> I was obsessed with him but he did this really really beautiful cover of Girl and it opens the movie so it's not like the full track or anything 
that he just does that first like phrase of the song and I was just obsessed with it so I remember talking to you about it and then you were like we should do it and I was like oh my god yeah (laughs) you know yeah well I I remember like like, because I don't I don't know if anybody knows this about like don't cancel me but I don't like the Beatles that much really (laughs) I don't but I remember hearing you sing the melody from that song and mm-hmm. I, I didn't know that song. And I, I was like, did you write that? That's gorgeous. And you were like, it's a Beatles song. And I was oh. like, oh, I take it back. <laughs> no, oh but God, I just, no. I heard you singing that song and I just like wanted to do it because that was such a gorgeous mm-hmm. melody. And I was like, that would work so well. It's, it's, you know, and you're very expressive with it. Oh yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I do remember that now because I was sitting on the couch and I was just like mindlessly singing to myself. Mm-hmm. And you and Christian were in the kitchen or something. <laughs> and then you were like, what is that? Yeah. And I think, I think, I think Kay <laughs> recognized it too. And I don't remember what she yeah. said, but yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, well, that's kind of another like chapter in my musical journey is mm-hmm. um, right when, because we were talking before about like why I make music. And so, like, right when the pandemic hit and I lost my job at Black Theater Troupe because it just mm-hmm. wasn't a thing anymore. Um, yeah. That Everything was like my down. first, like, yeah, they shut down. But like mm-hmm. my first like plan was I was like, all right, I'm gonna like rededicate myself to music. And that's when I started mm-hmm. making a lot of covers. Cause I was like, I wanna try to like make covers of songs and like, you know, videos and I'll be, I'll become popular and make a million dollars or whatever. And <laughs> at the time, that's what I was going for is I was trying to be like more mass appeal and I was trying to like, and it didn't work. Yeah. It really didn't. I, and so that's why I've kind of changed my approach with this upcoming album, because for me, like I, I just needed to redefine what I consider to be success, you know, because like some people say like if they release music and they get less than you know a thousand followers or nobody buys it or whatever then they failed Mm -hmm. but for me the way i define my success is that once i have released my album and it's on spotify you can go and listen to it i've succeeded because i made something that i like and that is meaningful to me and i've kind of decided that that's what my music career is going to be you know i I've decided that I'm going to make music that I like and if people want to listen to it, they can. And if they don't, fine. You know, I just, I've, I've kind of realized that trying to uh, appeal to what I think people want, I'm not good at and doesn't work. So, <laughs> you know, that's not the right approach for me. Well, that's exactly how I feel about playing jazz at this moment in time is because I was playing jazz in, obviously in my undergrad when I got my jazz degree and I had these ups and downs of really loving it and really hating it and it Mm -hmm. wasn't because of the art form itself it was because of the kind of overall mindset that I was feeling was coming from academia like just jazz school in general and then the mindset of the folks that were in the program that were in the jazz community here and you know, there was this whole idea at ASU that, you know, if you weren't like this really killing straight ahead player, if you weren't really good at bebop, then you weren't really good at having this particular sound, then you weren't really very good at all. And like, I'm going to talk to other people about this on this podcast, because I know that that isn't the only opinion out there. But a lot of the people that shared that opinion with me, they were just like, dude, you need to learn, you need to learn your stuff. You know, they were really just, I felt like they were really just saying it because they were like projecting their own insecurities onto me. This whole idea that they needed to sound a certain way, they they felt that about themselves and then they were pushing it onto me. And I think that that happens a lot like in music in general where, uh, and especially in, in music school, and I don't wanna go on a tangent too much about this, but you have this expectation and this idea that you need to sound a certain way. And then if you don't sound that way, you're not good or you're not good enough or you're not going to succeed or whatever it is. And in, in, in the jazz world, you know, it's one thing I think it's incredibly hugely important to respect what jazz is and what it started as and like understand the tradition and understand that it's black American music. It's not white people music, white people play it, but just because I'm a white person and I play it doesn't mean that it's white people music, you know, just to like understand the tradition, where it really comes from, 
and what what genres of music kind of like came from jazz all that stuff is really important but when you're a jazz musician and you're improvising on stage you don't have to sound like this exact like jazz musician you know like this exact like jazz great that everyone wants you to sound like because half the time you know sometimes the people that were being idolized were black musicians but only half the time the other time you know it was white musicians that they were idolizing and i thought it was just really silly that like they expected me to sound like these old white dudes that i didn't want to sound like and that speaks to classical music as well this whole it like definitely well, does you know everything well, I, that we I learn think that, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh i think a similar concept to what you're like my experience in the music composition program at asu they heavily emphasize uh like they 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 try to get you to emulate you know certain styles of composition um Mm -hmm. like they want you to write like beethoven or like you know uh weyburn or bruckner Mm -hmm. or like but the thing is all of these people that are in the the western kind of classical music canon are there because they were white men who yeah. were wealthy, who had access to resources, you know? And and I really think that kind of the idea of canonization in general really is a form gate, of gatekeeping um, mm-hmm. because in several ways, I mean, first, like if you try to look at like what orchestras are playing for their audiences, a large part of that is determined by what the orchestra board thinks is like traditional or what they think the audience expects now Mm -hmm. does that mean that audiences in 2020 today really 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 want to hear beethoven symphonies and schumann symphonies maybe but that's not the important thing the important thing is that it's beethoven and that this orchestra is playing mozart that's the important thing for them is because they want to be seen as like kind of a part of the group of elite orchestras that perform those works. And I think that the other side of that coin is the effect that this has on students. Like for example, if you want to play the violin, then you have to learn how to play Mozart violin concertos and you have to learn how to play Beethoven section violin parts and orchestra. You have to. (laughs) There's no way around it. You can't, and, and, You know, so if you want to get a degree from ASU, you have to learn how to play music by old white men. There's no option not to. And, you know, the reason why for instrumentalists, those particular pieces are used as the benchmark. It's like there's not really a good reason. It's like there's plenty of new music, even written by white men that are younger. You know, there's plenty of new music out there that assesses those same technical skills. But the reason yep. why we use the same Mozart and Beethoven excerpts over and over and over and over and over again is because of this effect of canonization, which mm-hmm. I personally think has really just been harmful to the art music scene as a whole. Yeah, I agree with you. And I mean, I definitely am not like a classical musician by any means or a classical composer, but I I knew a lot of people who were at ASU, you included. And I also just kind of thought that classical music from that era is just very elitist. And it's just this whole, it's this whole thing. And, you know, music from Europe, I guess, you know, it just sucks that a lot of, um, music education at that higher level has such like elitism to it. Um, it fails it really to really does. talk about and the bigger picture, you know? And like, I guess the it, bigger picture is like world music. I don't know, maybe we should like talk about anyone else. I was just gonna bring that else. up because mm-hmm. that is really like academia's attempt to not just be white music, right? Is that they have a class called world music that they talk about every other continent except Europe in the space of two semesters or even one semester. Even just one semester, and that's, yeah. And that's it, that's all you get, right? And so most, I would, I would I'd be willing to bet that like 90% of people who take that class, the only thing they remember is Javanese gamelan. I'd be willing to mm-hmm. bet, you know, they could not tell you different kinds of African drumming techniques 
or Mm -hmm. about brass techniques in Latin American, you know, music, or Mm -hmm. I bet you that they do not know anything about these topics. But the sad part of it is that if these people were truly interested in informing their own practice as, as classical musicians in a European orchestra or composers composing for European orchestra, those practices could be informed and improved by studying these other cultures, by studying Latin American music, East Asian music, African music, they could drastically improve their own practices and techniques. Mm -hmm. But there's just this insidious belief that like it's less sophisticated than what we do in conservatories where we study European art music. It's just all snoozeville to me, European art music. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But all honestly, that is my like true opinion is like, I think that I was attracted to jazz music early on in life because it was so different and so much less boring to me and so much less like in a box. And like, look, again, I'm not a classical musician, and I bet you there are classical musicians that I could have on here that would have a completely different argument as to, like, how that music makes them feel and, like, what it's, like, truly about, Um, but I just think that it's important to remember that these institutions teach more white music than anything else, and again, we're in a country that was not white and that was never supposed to be, I mean, I'm not saying America, like white people should have never shown up here and America should have never been founded. But I am saying well, that like- you could make the argument. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I just, you know, sometimes, you know, my, my idea is just like, let's just give, give it all back to the Native Americans. Maybe not oh, all, I, but absolutely give it support back. Land back. Absolutely. Give it back. They've been, they've been doing nothing but suffering. Like we're not doing anything to make the reservations a better place to live. Absolutely. And I believe that the entire continental United States should be returned to indigenous peoples with interest paid for the, all the years that mm-hmm. this land has been stolen from them. Yeah. And I mean, oh man, there's just, there's so many links that I'm going to drop into the chat, like, and not just today, but just throughout the entire podcast, because um, there are colleges who, um, owned slaves at the beginning of their university's founding. Colleges? I didn't even know yeah, that. Yeah, universities. And I can't remember the name of this university, and that's why I need to, like, find the source and give it out. Um, yeah, there, there was a college, uh, and I'm sure there's not only one. There were many that owned slaves and, you know, profited off of, obviously profited off of slave labor. And, um there was a there was a like hidden fee in their admissions that actually would be given back to the black community of the of the city that this college is in. Then they decided to get rid of that entirely and just stop stop giving back. And now it was going to be a voluntary thing where um, you would have to decide to pay money that would go to this community. When, as before, the whole idea was that this college was supposed to say, okay, well, as part of our, like, admission fees, this amount of money, this, like, fee is going to go straight to this community. And then they stopped doing that. And, yeah, well, you know, it was the bare minimum to begin with that they were even doing that, just like a small fee that was going back. But, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. reparations is just this huge thing that we could talk Absolutely. about on this podcast And as I mean, well. really... That's another conversation about like putting the onus on the individual Mm -hmm. to pay that because I mean, like if it's a a, an affluent or wealthy white student, then sure, obviously. Mm -hmm. But like if that's if if something like that does become mandatory and attached to like a college's entrance fees, that's yet another financial barrier for like black and brown Mm -hmm. students trying to go to that college. You know, I well, mean, I think, and, and this is, this is where I need to, and I, maybe I shouldn't have brought it up because I'm just not remembering it super well, but I'm pretty sure that this, this money was meant to um, go to, not just to the community, but to a college fund that would fund those people of color oh, to go to the school. Um, okay, so I, I think that was that. part of what it was for. And I think it was pretty small. It was probably like under $20, you know, it was something oh. that you could barely even notice. But if enough people that were going to the school, you know, paid that, it would build over time and stuff like that. But, um, Absolutely. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll find that source and I'll drop it and we'll talk about it more in another episode because um, I really do want to talk about like, what does it mean to give back to people of color and how can you do it? And it's so much more than just saying like, well, I support people of color <laughs> or like, well, I'm not, I'm not racist. If you ever say, and I mean it, everyone listening, if you ever say that you're not racist, I'm probably going to think that you are. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. And it's because if you have this, this dire need to put both hands up and defend that you're like not racist, that you're not this bad person, then maybe you really need to think about why you feel that way Absolutely. and why you feel the need to say that. Because, you know, we and all, okay. Be, mm -hmm. Sorry. It can be other things other than just the words, I'm not racist too. I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of other actions that I've seen white people take that really seem like they're more for people watching to make sure everybody understands that I'm a good white person rather than just, I'm doing this just because it's the right thing to do. God, and I mean, I've heard this so much on the, on the you know, sexism side of things where a guy is like, I love women. I respect women. Oh, I just respect the heck out of women, but, oh, and then they say, Lord. but, and then they say something entirely, completely disgusting and disrespectful. And this happened to me um, at school a lot, you know, where like a faculty member would say, look, I love women. I respect women. But, at your elementary like, school? No, not at my elementary school. I was actually talking about at ASU. Um, some oh. of the professors that I had would kind of have a little slip up. They would be talking Ooh. about a like female musician and so in this instance, um, they were talking about a vocalist, a jazz vocalist, and he said, you know, I love women, I respect women, and he looked right at me, because I'm the only girl in the room, and he said, you know, I hope you don't take offense to this, but she was kind of just there for eye candy, and that's what he said, and I mean, oh. <laughs> I was just like, oh my god, like at this point, oh my god, it was like, this was like 2017, I was just like, whatever, I've heard it all before, but this is this is just like an example of something that people do is they, they say that, you know, they start off the sentence with, I'm not, I'm not this. Don't believe that I'm this because what I'm about to say is going to make you think that, but I promise you, I'm like totally not that way. And I mean, you know, I did watch some of the most recent debate with Trump and Biden. and He said, I'm not racist. I'm the least racist person in this room. And like, we all know, like, and if you don't know, Trump's a racist. Uh, <laughs> You know, we'll see if this makes this if this makes it into the podcast. But he's a racist, so um, him saying that I'm the least racist person in the room is an example of what I like to call projection. Okay, like he's just like talking about himself. You know, like I am a racist, but I need to make sure everyone doesn't think so. So I'm just gonna like put out, put it out there that I'm not, and call Biden the racist, or just say that I've done more for the black community than any other president since Abraham Lincoln, because that's another insane thing that he said, is he said that he's done more for the black community than any other president before Abraham Lincoln. And I was just like, oh God. It's just like the craziest things that you could possibly say. And the moderator was a woman and she was like, and I mean, the only reason why I'm pointing that out is because he blatantly just like ignored the heck out of her every chance that he could, you know, he just kept talking and Pence did this too. in the vice president debate, they just keep talking and they don't shut their mouths and they don't respect the fact that they're not allowed to do that. And they just talk over time. And like, I think that men like that, people like that, they just don't care about anyone else. They only care Absolutely. about like what they can say and how it can impact people for themselves. Like, not for anybody else. Like, how does this benefit me? How am I going to come across to these people? That's why they say these things, you know? And what sucks is that a, a good amount of Trump supporters don't believe that he's racist. But I guess, like, what I do want to touch on a little bit is that you can be well, racist without realizing that you're being racist. And you yes, need to, like, that's kind of... Recognize. That's kind of what I meant earlier when I was talking a bit about, like, Trump pulling the mask off the Republican Party mm -hmm. is that's kind of what I was getting at is like a lot of people, even if you would, you know, if you went to all the effort to like put together a 45 minute like compilation of Trump clips where he says awful things that are racist, you could make somebody who's a Trump supporter listen to, and sit down and listen to all of it and it wouldn't matter. They would find ways to argue that he's not racist or whatever because the fact is they don't care. Like, 
either they get that he's racist and in their brain they're going, it doesn't matter, I still support him, or they just completely don't put two and two together that he's racist and it doesn't matter to them because the bottom line for them is they like the things that he does as president. And with normal Republicans, like somebody like Mitt Romney, it's a lot easier to Mm -hmm. pretend that there's this pretension of like, oh, well, I like the principles he stands for. But with Trump, it's a lot harder to pretend, you know, because it's like Trump's immigration policy. He's been very, very, very clear about Mm -hmm. why he does that. So if you support Trump because you like his immigration policy, everyone knows what you're saying you like and what you think Mm -hmm. you, what you're saying that you support. And when I was saying, you know, a lot of people are being racist without realizing they're being racist is some, some of them are aware that when they say that they like his immigration policy, they're also saying that they support his like incredibly racist and disgusting rhetoric that he like spits about the Latinx community, like calling Mexicans rapists and criminals is like extremely racist. And the people that say, well, you know what? Because I've heard this when I grew up in Tucson, like a 100% like completely Latinx community, you know, people would say, well, you know, some of them are criminals and some of them are drug dealers and some of them, you know, really are bad for society and we shouldn't be letting them in because they're, but all those you know, they're taking our jobs. People. Oh my God. Yeah. And like white people, I don't know, like, do we need to even go into the fact that, you know, most mass shootings are committed by white people? not people of color and that most white people will shoot people of color in mass shootings more often than they'll just shoot white people but you know that's like a whole separate conversation you know white people are extremely harmful and have been historically extremely harmful so to just say that oh well, that you know they they are criminals you know like he's on to something here like we really do need to protect our communities and not let these people uh you know, enter the country illegally. And also, you know, well, they should just enter legally. Why won't they? I don't think anybody realizes how difficult it is to become a legal citizen in this country. It takes years upon years to get that paperwork. That most Mm -hmm. white Americans could not pass. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like just look into what it takes to become a citizen here and, you know, then come and talk to me about it. But <laughs> okay, you know, I think we need to kind of transition into some closing thoughts here. Um, okay. And I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna, you know, take a look at this and 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 edit some stuff down and kind of like shift it around. But totally. I think that we hit on a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, we talked about your music and about your upcoming album, and we talked about kind of like the the music that you've made in the past and like. Yeah how how it's kind of shifted and how your perspective has shifted and you know we touched on some really important stuff about you know white privilege and you know using your your voice and your platform to make a difference and one of the things that I really want to do is I'm not trying to you know make everybody think a certain thing really I just kind of I guess in a way I am because I just want people to see the world through you know not through rose-colored glasses. I don't want people to be willfully ignorant anymore. I want people to really look at things for what they are and, and understand that, you know, what's going on in this country is that it's a really oppressive country, like historically, you know? So it's, I want to talk about these things because these are very relevant social issues to today. They totally, totally, link up with the music that's being made today the music that you make and you know i think that it's really important for young people to know that like you know if you've been staying quiet out of fear of what it'll seem like if you do talk or if you've just been quiet because you're you know trying to get informed and learn more you know just know that your your voice matters your vote matters your thoughts really matter and even if you don't agree with me and what I'm saying on here tonight your thoughts are still valid and they still matter what I will tell you is that if you if you think Trump is not racist your thoughts are not valid (laughs) well if you if you think that he's not a racist then you probably don't really understand maybe 
what it means to truly be a racist. You know, it's not just saying racist things. It's the way that you treat other people of color or don't treat them, you know? And it's the way that, yeah. Especially for a politician, we can't Mm -hmm. evaluate them just based on what they say. It has to be a look at how their policies have actually affected people. Um, Mm -hmm. Especially people of color and poorer people communities um, and LGBTQ people. I mean, because there are plenty of politicians who give a great speech and are super inspiring. And then if you look at what they have actually done Mm -hmm. with their time in office, uh, they have had a detrimental effect on, on some of these communities. So I won't go into a too long a tangent about who I'm talking Mm -hmm. about, but that is true for a lot of different politicians. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. And I mean, the the deep-seated misogyny that's in politics and just um, kind of the way that politicians have treated women and how women who are politicians kind of have to play this game in order to, one, be taken seriously and and, and two, to just kind of be able to like survive in that, in that climate. Well, That's in any say... climate, really. I mean, what you were just mm-hmm. saying about that, that woman vocalist in that jazz mm-hmm. course. I mean, I can't yeah. believe that a professor really thinks that she's just there because she's pretty. I mean, that's the front woman of a band. That's, you well, know. I think the part of what he was saying was that maybe the guys in the band were kind of perceiving her that way. I don't think he was necessarily saying that he thought she was eye candy, but he was trying to say like, you know, she was there for this reason. Doesn't make it any less messed up that he said it and that he had to point at me and be like, don't be offended. The only woman in the room. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because if you truly are just saying that these guys in her band treated her badly, you could have just said that. Instead, you said what you said. So I think that like the way that we talk about these issues is really important too. If you want, if you're going to be a man who is cis straight passing, you know, like someone who seems like a very privileged man and you're going to say something like that, you know, you have to know how that's going to come across and the effect that that's going to have on your students and the people that are listening to you. And I don't know. It's just, <laughs> there are like so many things that I think we talked about and touched on tonight, but, um, yeah. you know, like, I hope that, um, in listening to this, you might've, you might've taken something away from this, that you might be encouraged to do some research of your own and that you might be encouraged to look into some of the things that we talk about. Um, because I'm definitely not someone to talk on queer issues, really, and I'm not someone to talk on um, issues of people of color as a white woman, you know, like, yeah, and just to speak it, you know, mm -hmm. there's been two white people on screen talking about issues of race, Mm -hmm. because it's an important topic that I don't want to not bring up, but just to speak that, you know, we are two colonizers here talking Mm -hmm. about this. Yeah, we're exercising our own privilege to be talking about this on a platform, you know, the fact that I have a platform that I can use shows my privilege. So I don't want to be using it and, and putting things out there if I'm not gonna, like, I want to be fighting for these things because. Yes. And that's how I feel as well. You know, like Mm -hmm. uh, I've had people try to tell me to tone down my, my social media a little bit. uh, Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I really believe that it's the right thing for me to do to mm-hmm. be loud and, and championing issues that need to be boosted into people's, you know, yeah. timelines. People, some people, and the reason why is because like some people truly are not aware and it's not their mm-hmm. fault. Well, I mean, arguably, but some people they haven't seen that link come across their timeline they haven't seen that story they haven't nobody that they know is talking about this and so when you share it and it comes from you that'll be the first time for somebody that they're being introduced to that and that's why i think it's so important because i always think about like how many people follow me or are friends with me on facebook that this is going to be completely new 
to them mm-hmm. and they had no idea about before I shared this thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the people that follow me on social media and a lot of my students do too know that um, I'm definitely pro, I mean, I'm obviously pro women's rights. I'm pro, um, I'm pro choice. Um, I really, really care about the LGBTQ plus community. And I mean, I don't openly talk about my involvement with that community much, but there's a deep investment that I have in that community as well, you know, and like, I care about it. And um, I just think that in education, we should be talking about this more, you know, absolutely. just because you're teaching, you know, as a music teacher, just because I'm there teaching music doesn't mean that music isn't the most personal and like also sometimes political and deeply social thing. Like it really is. And like these issues come to play in our music all the time. It really is. And, and you know, mm-hmm. like, like you just said, I mean, a lot of music is, is very political. I'm trying to look up um, the name of that person because I thought of an example, but Mm-hmm. Um, that the black woman who was famous for singing Strange Fruit, was it? Um, Billie Holiday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't remember her name just now. Mm-hmm. But I read the other day that when she was, she would made a career off of singing that song all around the country. Mm-hmm. And the FBI tried to stop her because yeah. the, the FBI actually like apparently like came and like confronted her and said like, we need you to stop. Like, spreading this anti-american propaganda Mm -hmm. and that's 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 music history right there i mean that's one way in which just the performance of a song in public is a threat to the united states government that's the power that music has it absolutely is and i think we'll do a whole episode on billy holiday because she's my all-time favorite um musician ever Mm -hmm. like truly ever And yeah, she talks about that in her memoir. The police were also after her because she was a black woman. They were also after her because they knew that she had a drug problem. They also made it impossible for people like her to make a living doing anything else other than, you know, I mean, she started out uh, as a prostitute, as a minor to make ends meet. And then, you know, when she got into drugs, you know, they, they kind of just, it's what I was talking about earlier. They just pin people of color as criminals, drug dealers, drug abusers, uh, lazy, no good to society people. And like, there's a reason why those people were born into poverty and yes. kind of stay and, in poverty. And, and there's a reason why drug use begins, mm-hmm. you know, it, the, mm-hmm. the, the major indicators for uh, potential addiction are poverty and um, what's the other one? Sorry, brain fart. But point is, your living mm-hmm. conditions can be fairly accurate predictors of uh, mm-hmm. of a potential addiction, and poverty is one of the strongest. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and one more thing about Billie Holiday: they arrested her on her death bed. She was in the hospital. She was going to die. He did. And yeah, they they had her in handcuffs when she died. She was in cuffs when she died. <laughs> I just want to, you know, let y'all know. Strange Fruit, if you don't know, is a song about lynching, about the lynching of Black people. And it's very vivid. The lyrics are very vivid. Um, bulging eyes, twisted mouth, vivid. And um yeah, I think we'll I think we'll talk about that and all of her music later. But she's a really really great example of kind of what we're touching on. You know, um, she she was able to rise to prominence just just from her voice. You know, her amazing wonderful voice. I think it kind of yeah. was like just fate that it happened. You know, I I'm never gonna say that people like Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald just got lucky. They didn't, you know, it was their amazing um, way of performing music and their personalities and just everything about them that made them successful. And um, the people that got to ride off of their success, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, like we just, yeah, 
we just need to give them more credit where it's due, but Absolutely. yeah, mm -hmm. there's just, there's, <laughs> this podcast has been amazing. I really, really liked like all the things we've been talking about. It's kind of been a hot mess Me when it comes too. to jumping, <laughs> jumping from topic to topic. Been, but, <laughs> but I believe in your editing skills. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll definitely just make sure that everything's good to go. Um, but if it's not, I think that I can upload and it somewhere need, else. if we need like another mm -hmm. section, we can do another like Zoom call and just like slip it in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and if I need to postpone it too, it's like really not a totally. problem. But yeah, I'll cut all this stuff out. My cat came into the room. Hi, Rainy. <laughs> I know, she's... I definitely wanted her to be more featured in the podcast, but it's just very disruptive yeah. when she shows up, you know, because she just, she'll yeah. like get on the computer and mess with stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like All I right. wish Pepito would like, let me hold him. Cause I would definitely like hold him up mm. or like, but he would try to bite me. He would, yeah, he would, he would growl. Be so angry. Yeah. Growly old man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we this is a girl mm -hmm. video. I was really happy that he was sleeping under the desk next mm -hmm, to Kristen. The whole time. Yeah, because that's mm -hmm. that's the only one of my videos that he's actually in, just because he was asleep <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> I know, sweet baby. It is cool that he was just in the room with us the whole time. Yeah. Aww. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming on and talking with me. Thank you for having me. Doing this. Yeah, this has been really awesome. And yeah, it we'll see. Been. You know we'll see um how it turns out um and you know thank you to everyone who's still here who's still watching <laughs> um and you know yeah like i was saying earlier i just hope that you know some of the things that we've touched on you know have kind of spurred this spurred some new thoughts in you you know some new ideas in you because that's really all i want to do is kind of just like be able to talk a little bit more openly and candidly about issues that i haven't been able to bring up in the classroom and that's kind of why yeah. I wanted to bring them up here. So, you know, and if anyone, um, anyone who's a student of mine has questions for me, I would love for you to reach out to me and any of my friends who are watching this, you know, if you want to talk more about this and not do it in podcast format, you know, or come on the podcast and do it, let me know. I just, I want to, I just want to do more of this, Absolutely. this very thing that we did tonight. Um, and I I feel like me and you would do this all the time when we hang out <laughs> you know we talk oh, about absolutely. stuff all absolutely absolutely yeah um mm -hmm. so for anyone who's listening and is interested in some of my music my website is benvining.com um mm -hmm. you can find all my old releases and my upcoming album is available for pre-order as well um and all my music is free to listen to on soundcloud so if you go to soundcloud.com slash benvining all of my music is always going to be free to listen to. It's a great, it's a great place to check it out. That's where I checked out your, your first EP and stuff like that. And that's where I first listened to it. So yeah. Okay. Well, I think, I think we got to wrap it up, but um, I am doing this podcast every week. So every, ooh, but except for election night, probably not going to release one on election night. We're probably going to skip that week, but <laughs> If we do do one, maybe I'll put it out another night or something. But yeah, normally it'll be Tuesdays. So I hope to see you guys on another Tuesday. Oh, it's next week, isn't it? Oh, she's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, wake up, people. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. Right. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that little conversation between me and my friend Julianne. Uh, Julianne's podcast, the Aria podcast, uh, will be continuing to put out new episodes uh, featuring conversations like that with musicians here in the Phoenix area. Um, so if you enjoyed that, please support her. Please check out her podcast. Um, and I'll drop some links down below to her socials and to her uh podcast and all the places you can find it. Uh, if you enjoyed the kind of things that we talked about, then my Thursday uh, just chatting streams are going to be similar to that, and I'm going to continue to address uh, similar topics about art and music and politics and kind of like socio-political um, topics 
uh, pertaining to today's world. Um, and on Mondays, I'm going to continue to just kind of showcase my music. So tomorrow, I will uh, be playing some games and have some music for you. Um, and on Thursday, I'll be back with some more chatting. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And I will see you all tomorrow.